the term. Excuse me. So welcome everyone to the final seminar of the Trinity Term Compass Seminar Series, uh, which is co-convened with CISOX. My name is Manolis Pratsinakis, and I'm a departmental lecturer in Migration Studies and the CISOX Onassis Fellow at the School of Anthropology, and I will be chairing today's uh, session. The seminar series, broadly speaking, addresses the theme of the politics of emigration. We have, in particular, focused on representations and contestations. So in previous sessions, we looked at how emigration is represented and accommodated by states which perceive an existential threat due to large out-migration and or by uh, geopolitical threats. We looked at the rifts between emigrants and stayers uh, despite an official change in uh, uh, the policy discourse on diasporas, we, which are um, increasingly embraced as the nation outside the state. Um, we looked at the new emergence of um, new political communities uh, that are being formed across territorial boundaries of uh, those states and also explored the relationship between emigration and uh, demographic shrinkage with um, illiberal discourses and policies. We had those discussions uh, with reference to Eastern Europe and today we make a move uh, to the other side of the Atlantic, uh, focusing on Mexican uh, migration and Mexico's diaspora policies as far as um, Mexican migra migrants in the United States are concerned. And as um, uh, most of you, I guess, uh, are informed due to unavoidable and unexpected circumstances, um, unfortunately, uh, Roger Waldiger is unable to join us today. But we are delighted and very thankful indeed uh, that Robin Cohen was able and willing to step in at the last minute uh, and he will act as a discussant uh, in today's session. Uh, here he is, um, which will center around the presentation of Alexandra Delano Alonso, who we are really delighted to be welcoming uh, today. Um, so Alexandra will speak about diaspora policies focused on integration and the protection of social rights across borders, focusing on uh, Mexico's diaspora policy in particular. Uh, Alexandra is um, Associate Professor and Chair of Global Studies at the New School in New York and the current holder of the Eugene M. Lang Professorship of Excellence in Teaching and Mentoring. She is co-founder and former co-director of the Zolberg Institute on Migration and Mobility, and she has received her doctorate in international relations from uh, the University of uh, Oxford. Her um, research focuses on diaspora policies, uh, the transnational, rela transnational relationships between states and uh, migrants, the um, Central American uh, corridor, sanctuary, and the politics of memory in relation to borders and violence. Uh, she is the author of the book, Mexico and its Diaspora in the United States, and more recently, From Here and There, Diaspora Policies, Integration, and Social Rights Beyond Borders, a book on which uh, partly her presentation today will be based. And more recently, uh, she also published uh, a poetry book called Brotes, and you can find more information about this book and other very, very interesting uh, extra academic uh, activities of Alexandra in her wonderful uh, personal website, which uh, Nathan will post on the chat. So uh, feel free to, to explore this. Um, Robin hardly needs any introduction uh, in an audience which is interested in the study of migration uh, and certainly not in Oxford, but just in case he's uh, uh, emerit emeritus professor and the former director of the uh, International Migration Institute at the University of Oxford and a senior research fellow at Kellogg uh, College. He has held uh, full professorships at the University of West Indies and Warwick and has taught in several universities across the world, in fact. He has uh, published numerous books which have been translated in several uh, languages, among which I would like just to make reference to uh, the latest ones, uh, which include the book Refugia, Radical Solutions to Mass um, Displacement, co-authored with Nicholas Van Heer, Migration, the Movement of Humankind from Prehistory to the Present and the Routledge Handbook on Diaspora, 
diaspora studies with Caroline uh, Fisse. Uh, the more, uh, most recent one is a memoir uh, he co-authored with Selina Molteno uh, entitled An Expatriate Family in the Nigerian Civil War, a very exciting book as well. Uh, so before I give the floor to Alexandra, uh, let me give you some like uh, brief information about the setup of today's uh, seminar. Uh, Alexandra will speak for approximately 20 to 25 minutes, and then Robin will uh, offer his commentary, which will be uh, a short one for uh, approximately seven minutes or so. And then we will open up the floor uh, for the Q&A. Uh, please uh, feel free to uh, put, insert your questions in the chat. Uh, today we only have one speaker, so it, it could be possible that uh, I invite you to uh, pose your questions orally, uh, if we have enough time, uh, let's see about that, but you can uh, certainly please insert them in the chat already and also indicate if you want to ask your question orally in the chat so that I, I give you the floor. In the meantime, do keep your cameras and mics closed, and with that I pass it to Alexandra. Alexandra, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Manolis. I'm, uh, thank you for that beautiful um, introduction. And um, I'm so excited to be back in my alma mater, even if virtually. <laughs> uh, it's lovely to see so many familiar names here of friends and colleagues and um, people that I've collaborated with in, in many ways. So I'm really excited about this conversation with all of you. And I, I just want to thank the, the organizers of the seminar and also Robin for um, their support and for the opportunity to engage in this conversation. I am going to share my screen. I have a, a PowerPoint with some data that I'd like to share. Um, and I'm, I'm framing this uh, conversation around the, the theme that was proposed by the organizers, the contested relationship between immigrants and immigration states, and particularly focusing on what diaspora policies reveal about some aspects, uh, some tensions and some of the contestation that occurs as these policies and politics are negotiated and how diaspora policies can also be a space for accountability in relation to other aspects of migration that don't just pertain to diasporas. And the Mexican case is uh, a really unique example in this sense, given um, it's uh, the space it shares in, in relation to the United States, but also the fact that it's not just a country of immigration and more and more um, is situated as a country of asylum, as a country of transit, and as a country of return. So as most of you know, um, Mexico's uh, relationship with its diaspora and with migrant organizations and migrant leaders dates back to the 19th century. Uh, Mexico has always had a strong focus on the protection of migrants' rights through a, uh, a consular network that, that is very extensive and probably one of the largest around the world that now is, is more than 50 consulates in, in the, just in the United States. Um, most of these policies in, in its origins focus just on, on, the, on, on documentation, on, on emergency responses to issues of um, confrontation with uh, US authorities or need for repatriation, as well as aspects related to the promotion of Mexican culture. Over time, they started shifting towards the possibility of how a relationship with the diaspora could strengthen the Mexican state's agenda vis-a-vis -vis the United States. Um, they also shifted towards thinking about ways of controlling or co-opting diaspora groups, particularly groups that were in opposition to the state and how to build an agenda that, um, that, that strengthened Mexican, the Mexican American population in the US as a potential lobby group. But over time and particularly in the 1990s, it became clear that the legitimacy of these policies and their ability to really uh, be able to uh, get the support of diaspora populations could not just be about extracting benefits or obligations from the diaspora, as, as Alan Gamlin has put it in his work, but also that needed to be sustained to the extension of rights. So this is the moment when Mexico's diaspora policy started to shift towards symbolic recognition, as, as many other countries have done through awards, naming them heroes, um, highlighting the work of um, talented, the talented diaspora or groups that were outstanding within the diaspora, and also offering voting rights, access to dual nationality and political representation. 
supporting with matching uh, programs for investments like matching funds program, the very well known 341 program um, that at a point became 441 and now is defunct. Um, and also political actions that were not just about co-opting migrant organizations, but also try to focus on how to empower them and how to support their own programs um, and also allowing them to participate more actively in shaping the policies that were directed towards them in the foundation of the Institute for Mexicans Abroad in 2003 with an advisory council that included 120 members of the diaspora that would be represented there. I want to focus today on another aspect of these policies which also grew in parallel to this extension of political rights and economic support which are consular programs that support access to social rights in the United States. So even though Mexico originally developed programs that were focused on the possibility of migrants returning to Mexico and therefore um, having access to health and having access to education through programming that worked bilaterally, over time we see a shift of those um, programs focused on social rights as programs that focus on the, the ability of the diaspora to have access to those rights in the country of destination, not in the country of origin, and shifting from the idea of a potential return in the future to the reality of, that mo most migrants were staying in the United States and settling there with their families, and therefore their, their need was more about integration and access to equal opportunity in the country of destination, in this case, the US. This has much to do with the shift in, in migration flows from Mexico to the US, as you can see here, um, how in, in around the, the 2000s, we see a peak and then a, a shift downward. Um, but the shift in from, from a circularity of migration flows that justified policies that articulated the idea of a potential return uh, changed in the, in the 1980s, 1990s, together with the shifts in US policies that um, and, shifted these, these char the characteristics of migrant flows towards a population that was more permanently settled in the United States because there was a regularization program and also <clears throat> it became harder to cross back and forth as a result of migrant enforcement policies. Um, and this decline in, in migration flows from Mexico to the US has as much to do with changing conditions in Mexico, um, demographic shifts that had already been predicted for many decades, um, also a context of violence in Mexico that for many made it harder to embark uh, on the journey, but more than anything with the increase in deportations from the US um, that have uh, generated more than 3 million people um, returning forced or, or voluntarily to Mexico in these years. But Mexico's um, shift in these integration policies um, has very much to do with these, these facts, that the, the fact that migration patterns have changed, the fact that the US doesn't have a, an explicit integration policy except for refugee resettlement. And at the same time, it has been able to shift towards these access to rights because of the existence of a strong network of migrant organizations, Mexican organizations, and also from other uh, groups and a host of actors and institutions that provide support systems that are alternative to what the government provides that migrants with precarious status can access and where the consulates can step in to fill a gap in terms of connections between migrants and these services. It's also relevant to mention how different these policies are at the state and local level that even generally when we talk about diaspora policies, we think about them nationally um, and here, we see the articulation of these policies varying very significantly depending on each consular representation and the context that they have in states and localities with a lot of backlash towards migrant populations. We see the struggle to try to offer these access to rights as a, as a way to support migrants, especially those with precarious status that have no alternative. And, and in states that are more generous and open and welcoming to migrant populations, we see the Mexican government and the Mexican consulates piloting programs that can collaborate deeply with public institutions and with private institutions in order to supplement some of the support systems that the government is not able to offer or that migrants are not willing to access because of fear um, regarding their status or lack of trust in US um, institutions. So, my interest in this idea that the, that the origin country is focusing its diaspora policies on the topic of integration 
is partly because when we think of integration, it's an area of policy that is most often determined as an aspect that is strictly concerns countries of destination. And it has to do with nationalism and identity and many other aspects that we associate with policies of integration, who has access to integration and what kind of status then puts you on a path towards accessing some of these services and um, creating a sense of community and belonging in that country. But what does the fact that the origin country is focusing on these services, that most of these services um, are geared towards populations with precarious status, what does this reveal about changes in understandings about conceptions of sovereignty, citizenship, and social protection? How does this open up new questions around shared responsibility in the protection of migrant rights as a framework that can shape migration policies and not just diaspora policies, as I said earlier, but also considering other migration flows? And how does studying and, and explaining these diaspora policies, their motivations, the way that they are implemented, their results, how can they also offer a space for accountability, especially in recent years where we see countries like Mexico, not just um, uh, as country of, countries of emigration, but as countries of return and asylum and, and um, wh where, where questions about what, how they are consistent with what they're demanding or what they're offering for its diaspora with what is happening internally. Um, so just as a, to put this in context, here are some of the data of um, return migration in Mexico that has uh, increased very significantly during the Obama administration, 2008, 2009. And it has uh, decreased um, slightly, surprisingly even, uh, during the Trump administration, but it's still at the highest levels that it has ever been um, with a resulting um, population of return and, um, return and, and, and deported migrants that exceeds three, three million in just 10 years. And yet, despite this um, significant increase in, in this population, which is the same population that, that these diaspora policies target in the US, um, they return to Mexico with absolutely no support and no institutional framework um, to have access to rights and facing similar discrimination in Mexico than they did in the US, despite the fact that they are citizens. And then we have the, the current increase in asylum seekers in Mexico, um, which, um, you can see here um, with a very, very significant increase between 2013 and 2020 with one, one, uh, just above 1,000 um, um, asylum seekers uh, requesting asylum in 2013, increasing to more than 70,000 in 2019 um, and facing a very um, challenging context in which Mexico also has very limited infrastructure of support, both for processing the, the request for asylum, but also offering a system of um, integration and protection for uh, asylum seekers that uh, are in Mexico. Um, and how this is, just highlights the, the difference between how it's uh, provide the resources, the material resources and the human resources that are dedicated for attention to the diaspora versus um, the work that is being done internally to support those systems in a similar way. One of the interesting aspects is also that this goes beyond the Mexican case. Partly Mexico has influenced other Latin American governments in the US in, in the way that they've also shifted their policies in this regard. Uh, but it also um, is related to a general trend in which many of these countries are seeing that, that the type of consular protection or the type of diaspora policies that they were offering in the past are no longer enough or are no longer uh, really responding to the needs that the diaspora is, um, is, is claiming at the moment. So here is our quotes from the consular of Ecuador, the, the vice minister for Salvadorans abroad articulating that they need to uh, respond to needs that are not met by the US government and particularly for undocumented migrants and articulating that the consulates become the space that has to fill some of these gaps, particularly for vulnerable populations, that they see a shift in consulates, not just being a space for protection and processing of, uh, of paperwork, that they have to be more active in protecting human rights. And the vice minister for Salvador and Sobrod saying, this is part of how we understand sovereignty now. Um, sovereignty is um, not just protecting the human rights of Salvadorans in, in our own country, but wherever they may be. Um, and this on, this on the side is this, um, this um, motto on the wall of the Ecuadorian um, 
ministry for um, the Ecuadorian consulate or the Ecuadorian house, uh, Casa Ecuatoriana here in New York that says, because health is a right, your government will assist you wherever you are. So this is a very different uh, conception of how they articulate what their role is as consulates and the extent of what their protection of rights means beyond the traditional services of um, tasks of consular protection, but really extending them to think about um, health and education. And uh, as one participant in one of their programs articulates here in the in the last um, quote, it says, you know, the, the the Ecuadorian consulate has given us the opportunity to educate ourselves. So looking for these opportunities for uh, for mobility, for access to rights, no, not in the spaces of the country of destination, but in the consulates themselves and attached to their country of origin. The Mexican government shifted its discourse um, in in since since the um, 2010, um, in the context of the Obama administration mostly, which was a, a more favorable context to look at opportunities for cooperation and shifting a discourse towards integration. Um, and it was articulated in the sense that um, thinking about consulates as integration centers and transcending these traditional consular services, similarly to how the other governments have uh, expressed it. But what is what I highlight here at the beginning of this quote is this idea that our ultimate goal is that Mexicans and Latinos in the United States fully integrate, participate, and thrive in their communities. So here, for me, it's interesting the fact that they're, they, they see their goal not only in relation to the Mexican diaspora, but a, a larger articulation of a Latin American or Latino diaspora in the United States, and that this is a, a, how they think about integration is to gain access to civic, social, economic, and political rights, and how this, this is now a task of the Mexican government, not just of the US government. Um, I think this, um, this work also um, calls into question traditional definitions of integration and, and what is meant when we talk about integration, what the goal of integration actually is. Um, it moves uh, away from any conception of assimilation. In fact, is, is, is uh, for some in contradiction or in opposition to that. Um, and it's focused more on mobility and uh, improving quality of life, access to better opportunities, public services, exercising their rights, empowerment, um, and, and seeing um, processes such as naturalization and access to these rights as the most powerful tool for consular protection. So in a way, it's a, it's a preventive type of policy um, that is about not, not waiting until a circumstance of, of deportation or, um, or confrontation with the authorities occurs, but how through supporting education, health, labor, access to labor rights, access to financial education, or even promotion of naturalization through Mexican consulates can be a powerful tool for consular protection for migrants in the US. Some of these, um, I, I want to just mention a couple of these programs and how they actually work. Um, but one of the important things to highlight is that these programs are not occurring in a vacuum, that it's not just the Mexican government coming up with an idea that um, that, that, that this, is, this is what's convenient, this is what's um, going to be a successful agenda, both in relation to the migrant communities, but also in its relationship to the United States, but that it's building on initiatives that have already been developed over the years by migrant organizations and that they have put forward um, to the Mexican government and to other institutions in order to develop programming that is really responsive to the needs of the diaspora. Um, it's a result of partnerships with public and private institutions in the US and Mexico and also other countries. And it works because of the consular infrastructure, because they're, the consulates to an extent are seen are safe and trusted spaces with cultural and linguistic sensitivity, especially for populations with precarious status who might not have information about ser these services that already exist and are provided by nonprofit organizations and other groups uh, and institutions, but that they, they, are, they would be afraid perhaps to access them in, in, without knowing that the consulate was associated with them, that the, the type of uh, language and cultural approach to these programs is more familiar to them. So this is where the consulates become an important factor, not just because they're on their own offering all of these support systems, but they fill a gap or they create a link where it is possible for migrants to access these programs in this particular space. Um, 
So I'm gonna I'm going to just briefly touch on, on all the programs that are mentioned here, but um, to briefly just give a, a, a broad context, the, the first ones are focused on access to health. Um, within the Mexican consulates and also um, in, in through health fairs that are organized throughout the country, access to labor rights to support them with reporting uh, abuse or claiming um, uh, fair wages, education, financial education that helps access uh, open bank accounts and access to programming to support them with access to credit and other um, opportunities for saving savings. Um, a natural naturalization workshop so they can those who are eligible can uh, claim citizenship in the United States and then educational programs that help um, continue education for for migrants that couldn't finish their complete their studies in Mexico or are trying to get a, a GED a certificate that would be that would make them eligible to continue their studies in the US um, and also offering scholarships that uh, students can use to uh, go to college in the US students who are already in the US. So some of the results of these programs, um, if, if we try to measure what this means in terms of integration, and of course, knowing you know, how contested the, the measurements about what integration actually means are here, what we see reporting as, as, as measures of integration is that migrants respond with articulating that they have a more successful interaction with US institutions as a result um, of these programs, improved access to jobs and higher levels of English proficiency their motivation and self-confidence improves, particularly for women that are involved in these programs. Um, communication with children improves, their, under their understanding of systems like the US education system or the health system improves, and parents participate more actively in their children's education um, and their motivation to continue on to higher education, which addresses one of the most significant problem problems among the uh, Latino population in the US, which um, has very low rates of uh, college education and high rates of um, dropping out uh, from high school. So this, this has a significant impact in, in the family as a whole. There's also um, increased access to preventive health, um, like vaccinations, nutrition, diagnostic tests that then reduce the use of emergency service, emergency care services, which as you all know, is a highly contested area where some of um, the anti-immigrant sentiment emerges in terms of the um, the overuse of public health systems and the limited, uh, or the idea that, that migrants don't contribute to these services and therefore they're overusing and abusing a public service. Um, it in increases safety through access to banking resources. Um, it, it has led to an, uh, a more significant amount of reports of employer abuse and a successful settlement of cases regarding unpaid wages or accidents and more uh, support with safety and equipment to protect them. Um, and it also was a significant factor in support with applications for the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program that um, was started by the Obama administration for uh, so-called dreamers, immigrant youth, um, who, who had this temporary protection status as well as advanced parole. Um, and the consulates also supported with uh, citizenship applications. Um, I'm gonna look at my time. Um, so I'm just briefly going to mention a few things of what these programs actually look like. These are, this is the education programming that has more than 400 sites around the US providing adult literacy, primary and secondary education, high school, around 35,000 students enrolled every year. Um, and many of those students, not just Mexicans, but also coming from different countries. Again, alluding to this idea of a, a Latin American or a, a larger diaspora population that's not just the US. Um, and it also gives uh, uh, people uh, who participate in the programs a certificate that then they can use to get other documentation for those who can't have access to a passport or other um, IDs like a consular ID because they don't have um, a birth certificate or other documentation in Mexico. This certificate does serve as, as one of those um, that can be used for identification. And it's in fact one of the reasons why some people are initially motivated to participate in the programs. As, um, part of this larger context of consular protection that starts with access to identification. The health programs are inside the consular offices. So when you go there to get a passport or any other kind of documentation or support for a, um, an issue of consular um, representation, you get um, usually the, um, health, health workers that give you uh, information or a uh, a talk or a workshop about um, issues related to HIV, high blood pressure, glucose, 
nutrition, any issues that are um, relevant to these migrant communities are offering COVID-19 vaccines, for example, um, in, the, in the current context. Um, and they, um, in addition to giving information on preventive health, they also offer diagnostic tests and referrals to hospitals or clinics that uh, offer services that are low cost or no cost to migrant populations. Um, and similarly, they, they conduct these, these health fairs around the country um, to offer similar services. But what I want to highlight here is how you see all the flags on the bottom that um, is, is through our collaboration, through all of these consulates, um, and also through community organizations, clinics, um, hospitals, um, schools, and, and many other um, groups that participate. Um, the Labor Rights Week is a similar uh, program. This occurs within the consulate. Um, and what is interesting here is that uh, the, the, the organizations and groups that come to the consular offices to offer their services and inform migrants of how they can help them unionize or um, claim unpaid wages or report an accident. Um, it, around 698 of these organizations come to the consulates, 719 cases are, were identified in only one year. Um, but one of the interesting factors is that US government institutions also come to, to the consulate and, and, and set up their, their booth inside the consulate to give um, migrants information about the services that they can provide. And this is, for me, a really important example of how this becomes a, a, a bridge or a safe space where migrants that might not ever want to access some of these services of, out of fear of what this means for their status, that in this context are able to reach um, uh, uh, communicate with these institutions and, and access their support systems in order to um, support their, um, their access to rights. Um, and then we have the scholarships that have um, offered more than 68,000 scholarships for college that are not just um, migrants, not just see as, a, as part of improving their education and their opportunities, but also um, change their perception of the Mexican government and their country of origin. Um, and, and, and change their, in a way, influence their, the way they identify as part of the diaspora, considering this is mostly uh, 1.5 generation or second generation um, Mexicans, Mexican Americans that are receiving some of this support. Um, and this takes me to the, the final um, part of the presentation where I want to focus more on, on, on what it means that the Mexican government has um, started to approach and shift its um, integration policies thinking about immigrant youth, uh, the 1.5 generation or the second generation. They invested a lot of um, resources and support to, um, to make sure that those eligible for the DACA program would be able to access it. Um, and, um, and, and some outlets, the New York Times and the Migration Policy Institute reported this as one of the um, most influential factors in the success of DACA applications. Um, the, the role of the consulates was seen as really significant. For the Mexican government, it was partly, of course, a strategy to support its population in, in access to documentation and rights and support systems, but it was also a way to reach a diaspora or a group within the diaspora that they normally don't have access to because um, immigrant youth, um, 1.5 generation, second generation, rarely go to the consulate to look for, uh, for support systems of any kind because they generally are, are, uh, understand US institutions in a, in a deep way. They've been to school, they know the resources that are available to them. So they have a very different relationship to the origin country and to the consulate in particular in this context. So the DACA workshops were an initial way in which they were able to reach this population and they saw it an opportunity, as an opportunity to um, increase their, their, uh, their presence in, in these communities and um, take advantage of the activism that already exists within um, immigrant youth, particularly the Dreamers movement, and try to um, link this with some of the political goals of the Mexican government in relation to its diaspora policies. So they brought many of these activists with taking advantage of the advanced parole that the DACA program allowed for, they brought many of these activists to Mexico to uh, engage in workshops and to think about what policy and what policies and what programs they could develop together to support the diaspora and this group within the diaspora in particular. But what resulted from this encounter is that these activists were the first ones to um, bring forward the contradictions in Mexico's diaspora policies, the discourse, and the and the way in which the consulates frame 
their approach and their policies and their relationship with migrant communities in comparison with um, the reality of the country and how migrants are treated within Mexico. Um, so here are some quotes about um, pointing out that there is no return or reintegration policies that they feel more accepted in the US even as undocumented migrants and how they feel in Mexico as Mexican nationals. Um, and here, um, others arguing and, and putting out very publicly that how they face um, institutional and social uh, discrimination in Mexico post deportation. Um, this is manifested in limited access to identification documents. Some of the documents that are issued in consulates, like if a passport is issued abroad or a consular ID is issued by a consulate to support migrants in the US, these documents are not accepted in Mexico or are, are, are seen as, as fake or insufficient by some institutions in Mexico. And it's very difficult for them to obtain documentation in Mexico. Um, there are barriers to continue their education, to enroll in schools, to access um, health protection, to access housing and jobs due to the limited documentation and the stigma and the discrimination that they face because of the way deported or returned migrants speak or dress. Um, and, and also um, this idea that they're, they're not really recognized, the, the issue of return migration is not really recognized or seen in the country. Um, so here's another quote from one of the activists arguing, you know, um, why did the government, why does the government spend so much money on us, on us visiting or us collaborating and developing policy ideas together um, as, as Mexico and many other governments do in, in convening the diaspora and, um, and creating a space where supposedly they design policy together, but then the reality doesn't really match with that. And moreover, it doesn't match the reality of uh, the migrant communities that are um, that are already there, that are returning, and or or that are um, in more recent years arriving in Mexico as asylum seekers. So they um, many groups have been formed in the last couple of years to articulate this demand to demand dignified migration and return migration to advocate at the same time for inclusion in the country of destination as well as um, integration reintegration in their uh, country of return or in their country of origin, also um, strongly addressing the root causes. So really making the connection of all of these issues and using the example of diaspora policies and the space in which these diaspora policies have been negotiated and articulated as a way to um, ask for accountability and to ask the government to develop policies that really match this discourse of, of support and access to rights um, in both countries. So to conclude, um, what are some of the implications of um, origin country involvement in, in integration policies? What does this tell us? One, I think is, is, is quite obvious for this audience, but that um, these are diaspora policies that, that move us for, further from the migration development nexus and migration diaspora policies that are mostly focused on, um, on questions that have to do with, more with um, economic interests. Um, and shift us into an, a new arena of thinking about what this means in terms of transnational social protection, the different groups that participate in diaspora policies that are not just government and diaspora, but there are, that there are many other actors that are participating in the, in the development, in the implementation of these diaspora policies, even in its origins and its design. Um, and also how this um, is in contradiction or, 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 or puts a mirror in front of uh, a discourse of return and open doors that usually um, is, is developed alongside diaspora policies, right? The idea that we reach out to the diaspora um, with the hopes that they will um, strengthen their links with their country of origin and eventually return or participate more actively in their country of origin. But here, it's a policy that's saying, that's saying in a way, you should stay there. And if you stay there, we're going to protect you. So um, it, it highlights a history of failed return policies in the Mexican case and a discourse that existed um, even in the 1920s and 30s when uh, there, were, uh, there was another, uh, another moment of uh, mass, mass return and, and repatriation of saying they should, they should just stay there. And they should just stay there was partly a, a, an economic and political logic, but also a, a result of a stigma that has remained for many years in terms of how um, migrant populations or the diaspora are seen as, as Americanized or no longer fitting in, in Mexico 
that is very present today in the context of return migration. Um, there is a lack of institutional development in Mexico. We see a, a complete disconnect between the diaspora policies, those who design them, those who implement them, and those who are designing other aspects of uh, Mexico's migration policy, particularly asylum um, and return and other aspects of uh, immigration to Mexico, um, which uh, is, is in absolute contradiction and, and, and lack of coherence in terms of resources, um, implementation, and the, and the focus and principles of each of these policies. On the one hand, we see um, a policy towards the United States that is uh, completely focused on access to rights and protection of rights. And on the Mexican side, we see a policy that in a way reproduces uh, US policies of control and exclusion and, and creating barriers for integration as a, as a way to dissuade migrants from staying in the country. Um, and, um, I think uh, going to the to second bullet point, I already mentioned some parts about how there's the multiplicity of actors that participate in the integration process that maybe um, rarely we think about the country of origin as one of those actors who can participate in the in the process of integration and thinking of integration again not just in the way of uh, assimilation but also as access to equal rights and opportunities um, there's also very significant gaps in in what this means and in terms of how we measure integration and the possibilities for thinking more broadly about how we can um, we can measure what is what is successful integration and what is needed for that process of uh, mobility and sense of belonging and access to rights. Um, I think what it, this also brings forward is who should integrate and how. Um, it's not, um, it, even if the Mexican government is, is actively proposing this integration and seeing it as a way that it can also benefit its agenda towards the US as an area for collaboration, there is a, a lot of backlash because um, it, of course there's a sense that why, why would migrants with precarious status with irregular status deserve access to these rights um, and access to these support systems. So what does it mean to, to put this question about integration in relation to this populations. Um, I think this is my last slide. I, I see Manolis giving me a sign. Um, I think some of the remaining challenges that we can discuss are um, there's uneven implementation of these programs. Even if I highlight their, some of their positive results, they're, they're quite small in relation to the, to, the, to the full population of 35 million that constitute the Mexican diaspora. There's lack of evaluations and transparency and capacity to measure these results, especially over time. Um, the, the programs are, have limited reach, usually within the boundaries of the, of the consulates that are in, in urban areas, even though they, they have mobile consulates that extend their services to other populations um, two or three hours away from their central location. But in most cases, these, these extension of services just is limited to passports and other consular, uh, more traditional consular protection services. Um, and there is backlash against some of these programs. Um, some consulates have been attacked in the media, but also physically um, because they're seen as, as spaces that are challenging um, the, the processes of um, integration and, and the loyalty that these new populations should um, should should have like through not, not traditional processes of uh, integration, for example, in schools, um, groups um, rejecting uh, bilingual education or sharing textbooks that the Mexican government donates to some of these institutions. So we still see that, and, and perhaps even more of it as a result of the the Trump administration and the context that we've lived in um, for the last couple of years. Um, at the same time, I do think there's an opportunity to think about um, how processes of paths to integration can be not just compatible, but also enhanced through engagement with origin country as an idea of, of sharing resources, um, of sharing responsibility and thinking about uh, uh, regional governance or global governance around some of these questions. The fact that there is so much collaboration between Mexico and Latin American governments, I think is, a, is an indication of a, a sense that there is, there is a broader agenda that's not just about Mexico and the US, but that more actors can participate and that it benefits uh, a wider population. Um, and finally, how can this be a space for accountability um, where governments, you know, here, here's a, a quote from Carlos Gonzalez Gutierrez, a consul general, who is saying, we lack the ability to think in transnational terms. Our whole infrastructure is 
um, to support them being in the United States and not returning. We do everything for them in the US and nothing here in Mexico. So how can this become a space where there's more recognition of these contradictions, but also the possibilities of learning from models that have already been tried and tested in the US context that can then be adapted um, to the country of origin and to address other challenges in migration. And that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Really a fascinating presentation. And without uh, any delay, I would like to pass it over to Robin. Robin, please. Okay, thank, thank you very much, um, Manolis. And Alexandra, thank you so much for your um, presentation. It was a tour de force, and I learned a great deal from it, and there's a lot in it. But I want to start at the very simple level, because in a sense, looking at this Historically, um, one can see an enormous shift in scholarship from the moment at which we all had a very simple bifurcation of the actors. On the one hand, there was the emigrant state sending people to country X or country Y. And on the other hand, there, were, uh, there was its diaspora and the relationship was simply the formed around the idea that there was a single thing called the state and there was a single thing called the diaspora. Now, what of course you've done is complexified both ends of that spectrum quite um, enormously. One is that the Mexican state is not just a singular object. It has all kinds of internal divisions within ministries. And as you correctly pointed out, um, between different states, some very close to the border, some far from the border, but some having very different attitudes towards returnees and towards emigrants. Um, and secondly, the diaspora for its part is a very much more complex. Uh, and in the context of the United States, it's not simply identified necessarily with the expression Mexican diaspora, it is very often folded into this wider category of Latinos um, and complex relationships between different groups speaking um, Spanish uh, who may have different origins and of course come from different generations. So that's the first layer of complexity that we need to make the state more complex and we need to make the diaspora more complex. But I think what you've also given to us is the sense in which we also need to periodize. So what happens in terms of policy, both on the north of uh, the Rio Grande and the south of the Rio Grande does actually affect um, the outcomes. Although I was interested, I don't know whether I've misread this, for you to hint, I suppose, that there's not that much difference um, between uh, you know, what might have happened under Obama, what might have happened under Trump, what might happen under, under Biden. So we tend to perhaps overestimate the extent of uh, change coming from particular US administrations, or perhaps this is just a lag effect that takes a long time to work through the system. So that's a, another layer of, of complexity, but I think the the other element which wasn't there historically, at least to the same degree, is that, as you correctly pointed out, Mexico itself is becoming a transit and an immigrant country with lots of asylum seekers and lots of other migrants from lots of other places. So what we've got here is a, a, a swirl, a complex swirl going on. And I think what you've done is cut through that complex swirl with a very interesting focus on, on the one hand, integration into the US, and on the other hand, return to Mexico. And I think those two directions of change, I think, provide um, an absolutely, um, you know, a prism to understanding migration in a more complex sense. So I had no idea until I read your paper and heard you speak, of the extent to which the Mexican consulates are intervening in multiple ways. Um, 
uh, but the ways in which they are intervening seem to go, as you suggested, the end in the direction of integration, or more in the direction of integration than in the direction of return. And I guess my initial question is: um, I'm not entirely clear, uh, although you intimated that was a, a preference. I'm not entirely clear why it's so lopsided, why in fact Mexican policy is so strongly um, uh, directed towards the integration of, of Mexicans in the US and so weakly articulating the return of migration. What is the main reason, not just, I, I understand you, you, you pointed to lots of contradictory impulses and contested things, but in that broad field of, you know, how do you explain that thing? I, I, I found that a little bit difficult to understand. But um, I think the second question I have is this, is your focus is on policy and policy implementation by state actors or actors like um, acting under their influence or direction, including these consulates and the many voluntary associations and bodies that are affiliated or close to the consulates working in the fields of health or education and so on. I suppose what I'm hearing less of, and I'd want to just hear a little bit more of, is the voices of the actors themselves of the emigrants um, are they in are they divided principally on generational terms are they divided principally on dreamers non-dreamers and i think perhaps just for the rest of i mean i've i i, I understand what dreamers are but maybe we need to just explain that for the for the community because not every, I suppose everybody's understanding that these are people who are um, came as 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 um, children uh, and have grown up in the United States, but they have illegal status and so on. So I I wonder what are the main divisions and the main opinions within the immigrant communities. Now, obviously, we haven't got enough time to go into all of that, but um, just as it were in a broad brush kind of way. So my two questions are really. One, can you give me the, the headline news? Oh, there's the little one. <laughs> okay. And there's the headline news, the headline news on why integration not return. And what are the big questions that uh, affect the Mexican immigrants themselves or the diasporic members? What are the, their main divisions? Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Robin. And um, Alexandra. Thank you so much, um, Robin, for your generous comments. I really appreciate them. Um, I think your first question also um, connects to uh, one of the questions or on the chat by Marie, um, arguing why, why there was this contradiction um, and in priorities. And uh, she's saying, one of the reasons is, is economic, right? The, they rely on remittances and it's more beneficial if Mexican nationals stay in the US but keep a strong connection with their home country to continue sending remittances. I, I agree, certainly there is, there is an economic logic, right? There, there always has been. 